Good morning, Mount Lewis Church family and friends, newcomers, and those of you watching online. I'm excited and I'm honored to bring the word this morning. And I want to I want to share a little little tidbit with you. If you're new this morning and you've not been a part of uh, our life groups on Wednesday night, I want to invite you to our newcomers life group with Pastors Brad and Misty. That's how you get connected here. If, if you're new to Mount Lewis Church and you want to get connected, that's how you do it. Hey, the message I want to share this morning is called Jesus, the only stable investment. So if you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you this morning, Father, for this word. But we just thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here and, and worship you freely, Father, without, without having to worry about being, being persecuted or, or drug out in the street, Father God. We just thank you, Lord, for that. Father, we just, we just ask, Lord, that, that you would use this message, Father, to speak to us this morning and just that you would bless this message and bless each and every person here this morning. Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, how many of you this morning would say that you're a rich taker? Anybody invest in the stock market? I'm going to tell you that the stock market scares the daylights out. You know, there is a lot of power in Wall Street. But there's also a lot of uncertainty. You know, and I would say it's probably a pretty safe bet that each and every one of us, or, or most of us in here, at some point in time have invested in something. For some, it could be a 401k, maybe an IRA, or some other type of retirement plan. Or, or maybe you've bought a new car, or a new house, a new boat. Maybe you've invested in rental properties, or, or maybe in a friend's business venture. Whatever it is that you've invested in financially, whether it be a property or stock or whatever, you're taking a risk. And you're taking a risk due to the fact that nothing on earth is meant to last forever. You know, let's, let's, um, let's imagine this. I, I'm pretty sure that, that most of us in this room this morning were not around to see the 30s and the 40s in this country. If you were, hey, I'm happy you're here. So let's, let's take a look back at the, at the 1920s in this country. <laughs> Okay, let's look at and see a few of the things that were happening during the 1920s in the United States. So on September 17, 1920, the American Professional Football League was formed. And it was later going to become what we know today as the NFL. May 5th, 1922, construction begins on Yankee Stadium in New York City, also dubbed as an outfit, Bay Ruth Bill. February 14, 1924, the IBM Corporation is founded. May 10th, 1924, J. Edgar Hoover is appointed to lead the Federal Bureau of, the, of Investigation. May 20th, 1927, Charles Lindbergh leaves Roosevelt Field, New York, for what would become the first transatlantic flight in history. September 7th, 1927, the first success in the invention of television occurred by American inventor Philo Taylor Farnsworth. May 15th, 1928, the first appearance of Mickey and Minnie Mouse on film. In a short film, it was called Plain Crazy. Now, I'm looking around the room, and I can, I can tell you that some of us in this room can associate with that crazy part. <laughs> October 11, 1929, J.C. Penney opened store number 1252 in Milford, Delaware. It was the last state in the union, union to get one of these stores. And it also, it, it also um, indicated the, the prosperity of that decade. Well, on October 29, 1929, Post-war prosperity ended with a 1929 stock market crash. And the plummeting stock prices co um, cost losses between 1929 and 1931 of $50 billion. And it also began what, what is known today as the worst depression in United States history. So for a decade prior to 1929, this country was doing good. good things were happening. You know, it, 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 we had the IBM, we had Yankee Stadium, we had Transatlantic Flight, we had the television, we had the FBI, we had Mickey Mouse for this. It was an exciting time in the United States, but all that changed when the stock market crashed. You see, people lost their jobs, they lost their homes, and many lost their, their entire life savings. So the world that they knew was completely changed. Now, the Great Depression lasted from late 1929 to the early 1940s, and it was a, a severe economic downturn caused by an overconfident, overextended stock market and, and a massive drought that hit the United States. So on a day that is known as Black Tuesday, the day the stock market crashed and the beginning of the worst depression in U.S. history, the stock prices plummeted, and there was little to, little to no hope of recovery. So a massive panic set in across the country. So masses and masses of people 
they, they went to the banks trying to withdraw their money when they saw all this happen because they, they were afraid that they were going to lose their life savings too. Well, also there were people trying to sell their stock, but nobody was buying it. See, because the stock market at that point had, had looked like the surest way to become rich, but when the stock market crashed, it became a path to bankruptcy for men. So, the stock market crash was just the beginning of all the problems. You see, many banks had invested large portions of their clients' money into the stock market, but when the stock market crashed, those banks lost all their clients' money. And so, that, that, was a, that was a bad deal. I mean, that would be like you or I going down to Arvest Bank and putting $2,000 in the savings account, and Arvest turned around and invested that money in oil futures, and we all know how oil works right now, right? <coughs> so if Arvest did that, and the, and the oil market tanked, and they put our money in there, we're going to lose that money. That's just how the banks made their money back then. They, they made their money off their clients. Well, when people began to see the stock market, begin to see banks close, they were rushing to the banks to try to withdraw their money, and, and they were afraid that they would lose their savings. And so this massive withdrawal of money, it caused more and more banks to close. And the crash was far-reaching, you know, because once those banks closed, if a client didn't get to the bank before they closed, well, there was no way for them to get, the, wasn't no way for them to get their money. So they also went bankrupt. So the crash was far-reaching, and it affected the entire country. And you can find story after story about families who had to adjust to the situations that they faced during the Great Depression. And I, I would like to share a couple of those with you this morning. The first one was of, of a man by the name of Mr. Robert Brenner of age 92, Plato, Ohio. And he recalls how, how customers short on money would, would put their purchases on a, on a tab at his, at his family's grocery store. And he says, in that time, he said, times were rough. He said, but there were many good people. And he said it was his job in high school to go collect on that stack of new bills. And he said he would go to the people and they would say that they only paid a dollar. But he said, believe me, they paid it. Romans 13 says, owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. You see, there was a sense of pride in the people in the 1930s. And they didn't want to owe anybody anything. They didn't want a handout. Mr. Brenner said that he learned firsthand that simple things lived the longest, like when a father would take the time to teach his child how to fish. Well, what if, what if more people in America today took the time to teach their children some biblical principles like the one we find in 1 Timothy 6.17, which says, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Trust, their trust should be in God, who richly gives them everything we need for our enjoyment. Can you imagine the possibilities? You know, Mr. Brenner said that he missed the days gone by. He, he says, what happened to those times when, when people used to care about their neighbors? Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, don't be selfish. Try not to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. He said, today, he said, people live, live right beside each other, but seldom ever speak. He said, he recalled one time when his mother had the flu that the neighbors came in and they they not only cleaned the house, but they brought dinner too. And he said one time that his father was hurt and couldn't work with the neighbors providing enough food for him and his family. He said those were valuable lessons from the poorest of times. Lessons that he treasured his entire life. Miss Paula Ashton, age 94, of Toledo, also recalled how financial woes continued well into the 40s for many families. And she said that what I remember most as a child that might help people today is that nothing was wasted. She said things were reusable, and life took more effort. She said the air was clean, the food was, was fresh and wholesome, the work was hard, but the freedom was wonderful. You see, the Great Depression created a generation of doers. And, and for many, you know, they, they learned to do for themselves. And for many, their motto became, use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do it out. You see, in today's society, we, a lot of us today in, in this society believe that everything is disposable. You know, you don't, you're tired of living in the house you're in, you can sell it, buy something different. You're tired of the car you're driving, no big deal, trade it off. You're tired of being a parent, it's okay, somebody else will raise your kids for you. You're tired of getting married, you get my point, right? In the 30s and 40s, people may have been lacking in many ways, but the people of this country had a moral compass. You see, the people of this country, they respected their neighbors. And they weren't afraid to invest in the things that mattered. They knew the value of a dollar. 
They knew what hard work was all about. They knew the power of prayer. And they also knew that the Lord God would see them through any situation that they dealt with. They were desperate. You know, as I look back at some of the stories I read online, I couldn't help but think about where we're at today as a nation. And it got me to thinking about a, about a story that I read in the Bible here not too long ago in the book of Ezekiel. And that was the story of the city of Tyre. Now, the city of Tyre was located in what is today modern-day Lebanon, and it was on the Mediterranean coast just north of Israel. And it was originally an ancient port which all of the trading in the ancient world had gone through. So you can kind of compare it to a modern-day Wall, Wall Street today. So there was great, great wealth, hustle and bustle, and, and many rich, rich people and, and lots of valuable merchandise came through that port. Well, the Tyre merchants, they had spread, the, spread themselves far and wide across the, the region there, and they had set up colonies and, and trading posts, so they were technically the first Walmart, okay? And all of this connected back to the, to the main hub of the city of Tyre. And, and the city of Tyre, they were doing okay for themselves. They were buying and selling I, I, uh, I Rock and, and Star Brew coffee uh, stuff on the, on the Noah deck, and they were doing okay, okay? They were moving along. They were flying high. And, and their, their colonies and their far-reaching uh, industries of textile, the purple textiles, it had them moving in the right direction. So the people in the city were flying high, and they were feeling good about themselves. They thought everything was going good. But it wasn't. You see, the, the profitable trade that Tyre had going on, it wasn't doing much for their, their spiritual well-being. As a matter of fact, as is often the case with, with riches, the, city, the, the money that the city had accrued had caused, had caused widespread recklessness and spiritual decay. The entire got a little greedy, and they got a little arrogant, a little cocky, and a little bit conceited. Well, how many of us have ever, ever heard of King Nebuchadnezzar? Well, that King Nebuchadnezzar, he was on this, this conquest to conquer everything in that region at the time. And, and he, he had just done, he'd just done away and laid waste to Jerusalem. And God had brought that judgment down on Jerusalem due to the fact that there was so much recklessness and, and just wrongdoing. You know, they, he had given them an opportunity to turn back from the way, their ways and, and, and leave their gods and their idols that they were, that they were worshiping, and, and they refused to do it. So that's why God brought that judgment down on them. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he had thought about just passing by the city of Tyre and letting them be because he knew that money flowed through it. But worked out back to Nebuchadnezzar that this cocky, arrogant, conceited little city of Tyre, well, they were conspiring against him with some of their neighbors to, to attack him and overthrow him. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, being this big king of Babylon that he was, he said, I don't think so. So he went on the offensive and he, he attacked the city of Tyre. And we're going to read about that city of Tyre here in the book of Ezekiel. So it's Ezekiel 26, 1 through 12. It says, During the twelfth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, Tyre has rejoiced over the fall of Jerusalem, saying, Ha! She who was the gateway to rich trade routes to the east has been broken, and I am now her heir. Because she has been made desolate, I will become wealthy. Now this laughter by the city of Tyre, I, can, I don't imagine it was much of a schoolgirl deal. I would imagine it more like an evil, maniacal, megamind type laugh. So they were probably more like this. <laughs> now see they were thinking, hey Jerusalem has just been destroyed. Now we'll be the top dogs, the king of the world, we'll be the main trade center of the entire entire earth. You see, Tyre did, all they were, all they were, all they cared about was just their, their wealth and, and growing their trade commerce. And they didn't look upon Jerusalem as an enemy, but more of a, a rival. So they, they were happy when their idol went down because that made them the top dog. So they thought that they would soon be filthy, sneaky, and rich. But here's what really happened. Verse 3 says, Therefore this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I am your enemy, O Tyre. I will bring many nations against you like the waves of the sea crashing against your shore. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and tear down its towers. I will scrape away its soil and make it a bare rock. It will be just a rock in the sea, a place for fishermen to spread their nets. For I have spoken, says the Sovereign Lord, Tyre will become the prey of many nations, and its main villages will be destroyed by the sword. Then they will know that I am the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. From the north I will bring King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon against Tyre. He is the king of kings, and he brings horses, chariots, charioteers, and great army. First he will destroy your mainland villages. 
Then he will attack you by building a siege wall and striking the ramp and raising a roof of shields against you. He will pound your walls with battering rams and demolish your towers with sledgehammers. The hooves of his horses will choke the city with dust, and the, the noise of his chariots and charioteer wheels will shake your walls as they storm through your broken gates. His horsemen will trample through every street in the city. They will butcher your people, and your strong pillars will fall. They will plunder all your riches and merchandise and break down your walls. They will destroy your lovely, lovely homes and dump your stones and timbers and even your dust into the city. You know, at one point, the city of Tyre was, it may have been a pleasant little city, and they were wealthy and had things going for them. And they probably would have continued to be that had they done what they should have done, had they shown a little sympathy toward Jerusalem, had they maybe sent them a little aid, a little bit of disaster relief, but they didn't. You know what they did? They, they more or less sent a congratulatory letter to King Nebuchadnezzar. You know, like, hey dude, thanks for taking out our rival. We appreciate that. But you know, for the city of Tyre, this was all about business. Because anybody, anybody that's in the business world knows that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, right? See, they believe that now they would have all of Jerusalem's customers and that all of the men who, who came from all over the parts of all different parts of the world to spend their money. They would now come to Tyre and spend their money. And they were selfish, and they were conceited, and they rejoiced over the fall of Jerusalem. Because they honestly thought they were getting a good deal. They thought this was a good deal for them. Anybody here ever got a good deal that thought you thought was a good deal to start with, that it really wasn't a good deal at the end? Well, let me tell you about a good deal that I had here a while back. Not really, but anyway. So this guy I worked with, he had this 16-foot tandem axle trailer. And hey, I needed a 16-foot tandem axle trailer, okay? So he was wanting X amount of dollars for it, and I said, man, I, I really don't have X amount of dollars to give you for it. But I'll tell you what I do have. I have this nice little utility trailer complete with floor and ramps, matching wheels, tires and whole air, and I'll trade you that for it. Obviously, this guy was a little bit smarter than I am because he agreed. So I sent Tyler over to make this trade, and he leaves our house with a, a nice little utility trailer, complete with floor, matching tires, ramps, tires with air. And he comes home with a metal frame with no floor, four different wheels, no ramps, and tires that go not hold it. And you see, the first time that I saw this trailer, I really didn't pay much attention to it. Stupid me. You know, so I didn't realize it needed as much work as what it did. So I made this trade, and I'm glad my wife's not here because she would probably be amen in the back right now. <laughs> but anyway, so I thought I was getting a good deal. I really wasn't. But you know what, we're just going to add that to the other 19,000 projects that Shelby has found for me on Pinterest. That's <laughs> all good, right? <laughs> So the city of Tyre, they thought they were getting a good deal here. They thought that this was a good thing for them, right? But it really wasn't. You know, they they thought that the fall of Jerusalem was going to pay huge dividends for them. And, and God says, wait a minute. You think you're something? You think you're all that? I don't have time for that, Tyre. It's time for you to go. So Tyre had made God their enemy. And they more or less hack God off, okay? So if you're taking notes this morning, write, write down these two things. One, don't make God mad. <coughs> and two, if we are secretly, secretly pleased with the death, decay, or the failure of others, that is a surefire way for us to get on God's bad side. And we're not going to prosper very long if we wind up on the bad side of God. You see, when King Nebuchadnezzar had attacked the city of Tyre, a lot of the people from the city, they had fled to an island just off the coast. And Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't chase them out there. He just let them go. Well, many years later, when Alexander the Great had conquered the Medo-Persian Empire, and this is long after Nebuchadnezzar's siege, the new island city of Tyre, they resisted Alexander's advances. So Alexander ordered his troops to build a causeway across from, from the mainland tire to the island. And he, he ordered them to take all of the rubble from, from the old mainland city of Tyre and throw it into the sea and to take all the dust and build a way for his troops to get across. And that 
alone fulfilled the prophecy that the great island city, that the great city of Tyre would be thrown into the midst of the sea. What would be Tyre today is a depressed city that suffered greatly during Lebanon's civil war and Israel's subsequent occupation of that land. They are a mere shadow of what they used to be. You know, the city of Tyre, they had some potential. And they had good things going for them. But they took joy and excitement in someone else's failures or someone else's hard times. And God doesn't like that. You see, the good thing for us today is that we don't have to be like the city of Tyre. We don't have to let our, our choices or our decisions ruin us. And we don't have to let our, our love of money or wealth cause us spiritual decay. You see, I believe we have a great opportunity right in front of us, in front of us if we're willing to take it. You know, there are people around us who are dying each and every day who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. And our personal investment or our personal testimony can and will speak volumes to, to someone who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have to be willing to accept the fact that Jesus Christ is our King and He is our Savior and He is our Lord. You know, in this country today, we have a tendency to put our trust or our faith or our hope in, in power or love or money or social status. But what we should be putting our, our hope in or our trust in or our faith in is that stock market of heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, our, our money's not going to get us into heaven. We can't drive that new car on the streets of gold. It doesn't matter how many stocks or how many shares of Walmart or Co-op stock I have. If I've not invested in the stock market of heaven, Jesus Christ, and put my trust in the Lord, then my future is not secure. And, and if, if I've not done that, then, then I don't have to worry about being financially bankrupt. Because I'm headed down the, the road to spiritual ruin, just like the people of time. Do we want God to bless us? Absolutely. Do we want God to save us from spiritual ruin? Sure we do. And we have to be investing, investing our future in the stock market of heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the goal of this world may be pretty and it may buy us a, a nice house on the hill in Anderson or Grove or Knoll or the Oak Shore or wherever. But it's not going to buy us a room in our Father's mansion in heaven. So what is it that makes the depression and the city of Tyre significant to us? It's a hard thing. Where were the hearts of the people who lived prior to and through the Great Depression? Where were the hearts of the people of time? We don't know. We think we know, but we don't know. So were their hearts were their hearts focused on God and pleasing Him, or were their hearts focused on getting rich and wealthy and, and living it up and trusting in the things of this world? We don't know. But what we do know is where our hearts are at today. Are we focused on pleasing God and, and glorifying God and giving God everything, everything we have? Or are we focused on the things that this world has to offer? Now, don't get me wrong. We need to save money. And investing money is probably a wise thing for us to do. But is that our focus? Is that, everything? Is that all we want for? Is that all we're living for? Is, is, to, is to get rich? Have we, have, we let, have we let wealth or prosperity become an idol to us? You know, investing money for our future is a good thing as long as it doesn't become an idol. And Exodus 20 verse 4 says, You must not make an idol for yourself of any kind or of any image of anything. You know, idols are only going to get us off track and keep us from focusing on what's most important to us or what should be most important to us. And that's a real life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. In John 6, 25-29, it says this, They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get there? And Jesus, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I feed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. Don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. And they replied, We want to perform God's works too. What should we do? And Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one who has sent. 
you know, Jesus was talking to his followers who were, they were wanting to be fed, but they were wanting to be fed with bread and fish. They were, they were really concerned about the future. They were, they were concerned about the here and the now. You know, the FDIC, they can't, they can't uh, secure or, or insure our eternal future. Fort Knox and the Federal Reserve, they can't store up all the, the treasures that we have in heaven. And the good news for us is when we invest in and we put our trust and our hope and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and our eternal future is secure. Because Jesus is the only stable investment that promises, promises us a secure and guaranteed return. Right. Are you ready to invest in the kingdom of God and your future in heaven? Yeah. Would you stand with me this morning? You know, life is full of choices for each and every one of us. And, and a lot of us are going to have opportunities. Some that will pay off and some that won't. And when it comes to the choices we make financially for our future, you know, it's okay to sometimes take a risk. But when it comes to the choices we make for our eternal future, there's too much at stake to be a risk taker. And when it comes to our eternal future, Jesus Christ is the only option that we have. You know, maybe you're here this morning and, and you feel like you've been, you've been pouring too much into your job or, or your finances or whatever. And maybe, maybe you're ready to get reconnected with God. Maybe you think that today is day to do that. I want to pray for you this morning. Or maybe, maybe you think that, you know what, maybe you thought your future was secured up and you didn't need anything else. I'm going to give you that opportunity as well. If you're here this morning and, and you're willing to say, hey, you know that's me? Let's pray again. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity, Lord. We just, we just ask, Father God, that you would help us to reconnect with you, Father, and just, just put us on the path that you want us to be on, Lord God. Father God, we just, we just thank you, Father. We just ask, Lord, that you would help us to refocus, Father, and, and spend our energy in, in the right place, Lord. Not worried about the things of this world, the material or the financial, or, or getting rich or anything like that, Father. We just pray that, Lord, you would help us to focus on you and, and connect with you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never had that real life changing relationship that can only be found through the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you this morning and you want to give your life to Christ, I want to give you the opportunity this morning. We're not going to call you down front. We're not going to embarrass you. But if you're here this morning and, and you, want to, you want to know what it's like to have a real life changing relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm going to count to three. When I do, show me your hand so we know who prayed with you. Real life change on three. One. I see your hand. I see your hand. Church, church family, let's pray this morning. Father, I come before you this morning. I'm going to need a real life change, Lord God. Father, I know I have sinned and fallen short. Lord God, I want you to rule and reign in my life. Father, I believe that Jesus is who He says He is. And that He died for my sin. And He rose and overcame that death. Lord God, I ask that You cleanse me, Father. And that You would make me new. Surround me with godly people, Father. And Lord, never let me be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mountain Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number 918-223-8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.